By the time she reached her 86th birthday, Hedy Lamar was in a sad state. Reclusive and reduced to a shadow of the beauty she once was, she left long, lonely messages on her children's answering machines. This sad end was made worse by the fact that she had lived a remarkable life that merged two seemingly impossible halves. She was an inventor and a pioneer of incredible technological advancements. But her high-profile life as a Hollywood actress meant that not many people took her seriously. So every now and then, we come across a name that neither Anthony or I have ever heard of. And it's rare that we get suggestions that somebody knows about that they really want to hear more about that you know, we feel we can add anything to. In this case, we're going to talk about somebody who really should be a household name, an incredible human being who managed to straddle two completely unrelated worlds, the world of movies and the world of science. And her name is Hedy Lamar. My co-host is Anthony Miederer, and uh, I believe you've fallen in love with Hedy Lamar. Sure, head over heels. Incredible woman. And, I, you know, I didn't really know at all a lot about her. First of all, it's a wild story, but it's also sad, her story. And then finally, she gets recognition at the end of her life. She was a giant intellect. She didn't have during her life the kind of acclaim that she probably should have. She certainly did as a movie star, and she was magnificent. I mean, if you see her in any of her movies, and I've seen little clips on YouTube, what a beautiful woman. She was apparently the inspiration for Snow White in the Disney cartoon. Correct. And also Catwoman. And Catwoman. And now that I've seen her in these movies, I can see exactly why Snow White looks the way that she does mm. in the cartoon. I mean, Hedy Lamar was called the most beautiful woman in the whole world at one point. And she was discovered, in inverted commas, by Louis B. Mayer. And we'll tell you that story. He was the head of Metro Goldwyn Mayer, the famous studio, in a while. But there's this brilliant documentary that came out um, just recently about her scientific contribution to the world. And that is where it's not just a biography of Greta Garbo or Marilyn Monroe, who were all you know, exciting and interesting people in their own right. But this woman is just, for her time and the diversity of her interests and her abilities, she's just head and shoulders above many other people in entertainment, if you'll pardon me being disrespectful to that particular industry. But um, she was born in, in Austria, and she was actually born, her, her real name is Hedwig Eva Maria Kisler. Now, Hedwig is not a great name, and she changed her name to Hedy Lamar on the insistence of Louis B. Mayer, and his wife gave her the idea of Lamar. Um, I think it comes from another a famous actress or someone who was famous in Hollywood before she came along. In the silent era, and Barbara Lamar, who tragically died very young. Okay. You know, it wasn't great to be German or anything related to German in, in America in the 30s. <laughs> so, no. So uh, they definitely needed to get rid of the Kistler part of her name. Well, I mean, it's probably worth, before we even get to her life in America, just talking about the, the life she had in Austria. So she was born into this, this Austrian Jewish family. Again, not a great time to be in, you know, Eastern Europe during the rise of fascism as a Jew. And then she had a, a mother who was a concert pianist, an incredible woman. Her father was apparently a very, very smart man too. I think her dad instilled in her, you know, he was very attentive to her and they would go for walks into the, in the country and they would look at tractors and mechanical side. And he was a very curious man. They converted to Catholicism mostly to just preserve themselves. And she was interested in acting. She, at the age of 12, won a beauty contest. Wow, she had such massive self-confidence. 12 years old, her parents didn't know that she would enter into a beauty contest. She won a fur coat. She went into the movies and she did a movie called Ecstasy. And apparently Ecstasy was, you know, this is at the age of 18 years old. These days, we'd almost think of it as child exploitation. Ecstasy was a wild movie for its time. I mean, it was almost like softcore porn. And she always claimed that she didn't know this, but that they'd used um, extreme zoom lenses to you know, show very provocative pictures of her and to get up close and personal. 
with this very beautiful, very young woman. And it was a, a sensation everywhere except in Germany and the US where they banned it because they thought it was immoral. There had been nude pictures shown in a movie previously, but this was the very first time ever that there was an orgasm shown on a movie. How they did that, they pricked her with a safety pin, and that got the response out that they put on the movie with the orgasm. She got married quite young as well, and this is before she moved to America, and that was a very unhappy marriage, right? Yes. The, the big thing with the marriage is also plays out later in her life. He was an absolute asshole, and... His name was Fritz Mandel, and he was also from a Jewish background, but he was a fascist. He was a munitions dealer, and they called him the merchant of death. So he would sell uh, his munitions to the highest bidder, and he was friends with Mussolini, with Hitler, and with all the Nazis and fascists of the time. And when she was married to him, and that, as you mentioned, at a very, very young age, she used to sit in these dinner parties that they had, and these idiots just thought, he has my arm candy. She's going to sit there and just the dutiful wife. But meanwhile, she took so much information in and she had so much information later on in her life to be able to develop what we will talk about later with regards to frequency hopping. But that marriage was what we can see. It was scary. The thing that he fell in love with was the way she acted and the way she interacted with the world. And what he did was he took all of that away. So he put her in his hunting villa or palace or whatever it was in the country and basically in seclusion, locked up. And in the end, it was a nightmare. So she, um, there are lots of different stories, but I think probably the closest to the truth is, funny enough, her maid at the time looked quite similar to what she was in terms of build and hair color. So she drugged her maid. This was just after a dinner party, but at the dinner party, she, she obviously asked Fritz if she could put all her jewelry on, which it's just weird that she even has to ask, but nonetheless. And then she, she drugged the maid and she dressed up in the maid's kit and got onto a bicycle and escaped. With all the expensive jewellery, she got on this bicycle and she escaped off to eventually to London. And that's where she met Louis B. Mayer. Correct. With Louis B. Mayer, it's a very, very interesting story. It just shows her massive self-confidence. Because when she met him, you know, he offered her, I think it was maybe $120 or $150 per day, which was an entry-level actor in, in Hollywood. And she turned him down. She didn't just turn him down. He offered then to take her on the ship with him back to America. And she said, no, no, don't worry. I'll do that myself. And she booked herself. She sort of almost double tricked herself because there was no space on the ship. So she went to one of her good friends that was in London at the time. And they helped her to get onto the ship as somebody that looks after a young 14-year-old child. But she never, ever looked much after the child. She kept trying to woo Maya. And in the end, he did bite. They ended up during the trip spending a lot of time together. He was there with his wife, so it was nothing untoward. And she uh, negotiated him up to $500 a week. Him and his wife, especially his wife, they were extremely prudish. And I think the Ecstasy movie, they were very scared of that. Well, she did arrive in the US with a bit of a reputation. And this also bothered her for the rest of her life because people basically treated her like a teen porn star. And they didn't give her much cred. She had that legacy. And so Maya controlled that to make sure she acted in things that were lighthearted. I mean, the studios controlled everyone's reputation in those days. And, and Hedy Lamar was protected as being this beautiful but innocent woman. And I mean, even in Samson and Delilah, her biggest success, she wasn't like this dangerous seductress. You know, she was still this, this beautiful kind of almost virginal woman. And I suppose that's a part of Hollywood that we don't identify with anymore because Hollywood started to develop the reputation of particularly the leading ladies as being far more like sexually aggressive and, you know, far more independent. In those days, it wasn't like that. Yeah, 100% correct. And she just didn't like that whole setup in Hollywood. So that's why they always thought of her as aloof. But people that were very close to her said she's not at all like that. But she said, I don't have time for these type of things. And Spencer Tracy said, you know, I don't like working with Hedy because she's so aloof and difficult to get to know. And then she just said, look, you slur the whole time. I can't understand anything you're saying. She went on to do, and we don't have to go into a whole movie history, but she worked with everybody. Spencer Tracy, she worked with Frank Borzage, she worked with um, Clark Gable, Judy Garland. You know, everybody who mattered in Hollywood. But she was very different from the other girls because she had this European streak of kind of knowing what womanly independence was. And 
she didn't really like to mix with all of them. And she did become a bit of a recluse later on in life. There's a famous story about how she would, she would swim at her agent's pool high up in the Hollywood Hills, but she would never go to the beach or go into a crowd of people. If you asked her for an autograph, she would say, what do you want that for? I think she mentioned once, you know, you, anybody can be glamorous if they just stand still and look stupid. They discovered these incredible tapes um, that a friend of hers had recorded in an interview with her. And it's, it's quite spooky to hear her say the words, you know, a lot of people think I'm just this stupid thing, that I'm this beautiful woman who was in Hollywood and was in these movies, and that that's all I am. And she said, I think people's brains are much more interesting than their looks. And that brings us to the thing that she should be most famous for, because her contribution is something that all of us use every day without even knowing that we owe it to her. Yes. And at the time, it was actually quite soon after she got there, you know, within the seven year period, she met Howard Hughes. He was a famous eccentric billionaire and he had his own production company, but he also had planes, his aeronautical factories. And for him to say she was a genius, it just gives you an idea. But he set her up in a trailer and she had her own drafting table and place where she could carry out her scientific experiments and they had a great friendship. She said he wasn't a great lover, but once that was all sorted out and they realized they're going to be friends, he was a massive supporter of her. And I think that played a big role also for her future. Well, she's supposed to have invented many things, including a, a fizzy tablet that you could make Coca-Cola. as like a compressed, concentrated Coca-Cola tablet that would also carbonate the water. Yeah, how clever is that? I mean, she said that she wanted this for the troops who were working on the front. Brilliant. She wanted it for people on ships. But the big invention was this frequency hopping radio messaging, uh, essentially a form of communications technology which had not been invented. So where it comes from is that, and they say there was a personal motivation for her because her mother was coming across on a ship and many of these ships were being torpedoed by the Nazis. So what happens is you would send a radio message from the ship to the torpedo and these could be intercepted by the Germans and then they could figure out where the torpedoes were and they'd be unsuccessful. But what she figured out with this other guy, George Anthill, it was a joint patent that they filed, is that you could do frequency hopping. Essentially, you could send a part of the signal on this frequency, then the next part on that one, and the next part on that one. So if it was intercepted, they'd only get a piece of the signal. And this was tremendous. They didn't actually put it to use during the Second World War, which is a shame because they could have saved many more lives. But they also disregarded her. They thought, well, she's a foreign national. She wasn't born here. So she may just be a spy. And um, they also didn't take her seriously because she was a woman and a Hollywood actress. They said, you focus on being beautiful. We'll focus on the science. Thank you. And the, and the U.S. Navy missed out. And I thought, you know, being beautiful and being clever, is it mutually exclusive? I mean, <laughs> it was just crazy how these guys thought. But the funny thing about the Navy, once they turned it down, they carried on blundering along with the torpedoes. I mean, you saw Japanese ships coming into port with American torpedoes stuck into their stern without being active. Nobody cared about the American torpedoes because they weren't very efficient. So it was crazy that they didn't take that up. She tried to get onto the National Inventors Council, and um, she was told that she could better help the war effort by being a celebrity. So she said, okay, fine, I'll sell war bonds. And there was this dude in the, in the audience who she knew, and they had this game that they would play where she'd call him up and she'd say if you guys buy a war bond, then I'll kiss him. And they raised millions. I mean, something Seven like- Seven million dollars in one day. Phenomenal, right? Just from I mean, her. Just from her kissing this dude on stage. And then of course he'd go back into the crowd and then they'd do it in the next town. And, and this is a way that they raised money for the war. So she was, she was also a, a conscientious citizen. She was trying to do her bit to support the war, which is absolutely amazing. Supposedly, her patent was filed in the category red hot, if you have any idea of what that means. It means that during the war, they were obviously prioritizing certain inventions over others. And they realized that there was potential for this thing to be used. And years later, it was actually used. At the Cuban Missile Crisis. Right. But by, by then, the poor woman's patent had expired, so she didn't earn a single cent from it. They say if, if we had to pay Hedy Lamar in the 90s, for all the inventions that would have been used by then and perhaps up to now, they would have had to pay us something like 30 or $40 billion for having come up with her part in this. Yeah, she stopped acting. I think her total career spanned 28 years. And I think after Samson and Delilah, she came off that. But sadly, the Hollywood studios would always want their leading actors to be happy. And they would give them vitamins every day. And it is basically vitamin meth. And 
And she got addicted to the vitamin meth and she struggled with it a lot in her life. And obviously then her behavior became very erratic and she used to have quite a temper and that. So there's a lot of things about Hollywood that stands out for me that just, yeah, uh, just very, very sad to read this. And the fact that they kept driving, beauty is your ticket, beauty is your ticket. Mm. This is what you're only here for. So she, she tried to preserve that and being how clever she was and loved to invent stuff, she started messing around with plastic surgery. So her face in the end did take a pounding from that type of stuff later in life. And I think if you see the pictures of what she looked like later on in life, it's a very sad state of affairs. You know, she was obviously addicted to the idea that she had to be young and beautiful because it had been such a part of her success early on. But she looks horrible at the end. It's very, very sad. Although, you know, even I have to say, you can see the beauty in those pictures. You can still see her in those somehow. Well, I mean, she was always very protective of her image. She sued a bunch of people through the course of her life for using, uh, you know, representations of her or her name. And um, sometimes they settled out of court with her quite successfully for for her. She sued Mel Brooks. And I must be honest, I love Blazing Saddles. Um, You know, that's a long, long time ago, 1974. But he named the character Hedley Lamar, you know, in in the Blazing Saddles. It's so funny, but... (laughs) <laughs> and, uh, you know, he said, wow, I didn't even know she knew who I was. Famously, she also sued Coral Draw using her photo on the cover of its products as well. Through the middle part of her life, she was really broke. But in the end, she died with quite a fortune. She did leave, you know, a couple of million dollars when she died. But she died only in 2000. I mean, that's not even that long ago. She died at the age of 85. You know, it's it's sad that she went into complete seclusion and she used to, because she was so desperate to communicate with people, she would leave her children these very long phone messages on tape. And some of those are also quite eerie to hear now. And they've released a lot of them. You can find some of them online of her just leaving her children messages about what her life was and how she lived. And she said, you know, she's been kicked in the teeth a number of times, but you've just got to keep on trying and you've got to be yourself. And I think it's the saddest thing of all that we only now in, you know, the years after her death have started to appreciate what she's done because her invention of frequency hopping communications has been used in Bluetooth, which is on all of our phones. Wi-Fi is an iteration of that, although there have been developments since Bluetooth. And many of the other things that we take completely for granted that are based on that very simple idea. George Antill and her you know, we owe them a great debt of gratitude for so much of the technology that we now take for granted. And she was the mother of Wi-Fi. That's what they're calling her. Uh, the first woman to receive the Invention Convention's Balbi Gnass Spirits of Achievement Award, which is like the Oscars of the invention industry. And she was also inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame for developing the frequency hopping technology. And this was done in 2014, so post her death. And the Frontier Foundation jointly awarded Lamar and until with their Pioneer Award in 1997. This was just before she died. So at least she had, before she died, she could see some recognition of what she achieved during her life. And you're being recognized, not for her beauty, but for her mind. Well, I think it's probably great news that Gal Gadot is going to portray her in an Apple TV Plus series on her life, which hopefully will come out soon because that'll be amazing. And I really think that there's an undiscovered story here for many people. Certainly it was for me which is just so fulfilling. As you said, it's a crazy wild ride. Being Hedy Lamar must have been extraordinary. Yeah, 100%. And you know, screw Mandel and screw Mayer. She stands tall now. The Blind History Series is brought to you by The Real Network. Herstory and other seasons can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Visit thereal-network.com.